Flamey-o, Hotman. I'm Jacob with Channel Fred Raider, and just like you, I remember Aang as the adorably charming hero from Nickelodeon's hit series Avatar The Last Airbender, which premiered back in 2005. But I just finished a rewatch of it a few weeks ago, and it's somehow even better than I remember it. And with the announcement of a live action reboot of the series coming to Netflix almost 15 years later, we here at Channel Fred Raider thought that this would be a pretty good time to take a trip down memory lane and look back on Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko's awesome series. But before we can even get to the adventures of the gang, we have to go a little bit further back. So brace yourselves because this is the Avatar The Last Airbender timeline. The Era of Rava Since the beginning of time, the spirits of light and dark have been engaged in a constant battle. These spirits are known as Rava, the spirit of light and peace, and Vatu, the spirit of darkness and chaos. Once every 10,000 years, a supernatural occurrence takes place in which the planets align and spiritual energy is greatly amplified, enveloping the Earth. During this event, Rava and Vatu engage in a battle that determines the fate of the world for the next 10,000 years. This event is known as the Harmonic Convergence. During the convergence of 19,829 years before Aang's time, Vatu destroyed the boundaries between the mortal world and the spirit world. With nothing to keep the spirits in their own world, they began migrating to the physical world, taking most of the land for themselves. These parts were known as the spirit wilds. Humans eventually had to split apart to seek shelter and protection on the backs of giant elemental lion turtles, and over time, many started to forget that other communities existed beyond their own lion turtle. The First Avatar During this era, people would leave their lion turtles to hunt for food in the spirit wilds. In order to survive, the lion turtle would temporarily bestow the humans with the power to control, or bend, whichever of the four elements that turtle happened to possess. One day, a young man named Juan stole the Art of Fire from the Lion Turtle in order to steal food from the rich and give to the poor. He was caught, however, and banished to the Spirit Wilds permanently. Out of sympathy, though, the Lion Turtle allowed him to keep his firebending ability. During his banishment, Juan encountered a dragon who helped him master the Art of Firebending. The technique he learned from the dragon became known as the Dancing Dragon Form. Then one day, he came across two battling spirits and decided to interfere. Unfortunately, these spirits were Rava and Vi Vatu, and because of Juan's interference, Vatu was freed to wreak havoc on the physical world. Seeking redemption, Juan teamed up with Rava and began training to master all of the elements before the next oncoming harmonic convergence. When the time came, he challenged Vatu in the name of Rava, allowing the spirit to possess his body. The two remained together during harmonic convergence, and it caused them to permanently merge together, creating the first avatar. Literally, the human avatar of the spirit of light. Thanks to the avatar's powers, the lion turtles were able to pass on their duty to protect mankind to the Avatar. Avatar 1 became the bridge between the two worlds. His task, and the task of all avatars that came after him, was to maintain balance and peace between the mortal and spiritual realms. Many years passed, and when Juan neared the end of his life, Rava assured him that their spirits would remain together throughout time. The Avatar would go on to be reincarnated in each new generation, ensuring the balance between the worlds. The Four Nations Era As humanity left behind the cities established on the backs of the Lion Turtles, they began to come into contact with one another, and because humanity is humanity, wage war against each other. Juan had intervened to keep the peace in the past, but to little avail. Once he passed away and was reincarnated, the next Avatar would do the same, and thus the cycle continued. Eventually, humanity split into four different nations, dictated by their respective bending arts. They were the Water Tribes, who learned the art of water bending by studying the moon and tides, the Earth Kingdom, whose people learned earth bending skills from the great badger moles tunneling underneath the ground, the Sun Warriors, who were taught the ancient art of fire bending from the dragons themselves, and of course, the Air Nomads, who were taught by the Flying Bison. As centuries went by, the nations evolved. The waterbenders split into two tribes situated at the North and South Poles, the Fire Islands were united as the Fire Nation, and the Earth King's power began to wane as civil unrest began to worsen throughout his kingdom. Meanwhile, the Air Nomads eventually expanded into four different temples, North, South, East, and West. The Fire Nation would go on to enter an era of great prosperity and modernization unlike the other nations. Avatar Roku and Crown Prince Sozin were born into the Fire Nation during this time of progress and became close friends in their childhood. Eventually, though, their friendship went sour as Avatar's gonna Avatar, and Roku became a force of balance and peace, not just among the two realms, but all of humanity as well. Conversely, Sozin dreamed of a global empire under his rule, and these ambitions led the now Fire Lord Sozin to initiate a number of reforms that militarized the country. As a result, both spirituality and respect for life rapidly declined throughout the nation, leading to the near extinction of the dragons. One might say that everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Eventually, several colonies were established in the weakened Earth Kingdom, which in turn quickly became local industrial centers. Sozin's expansionism was eventually stunted by Roku, though, since all of this goes against his whole spiritual purpose. Years later, though, as Roku lay dying after a failed attempt to control a volcanic eruption, he begged Sozin for help. Sozin rationalized, however, that with Roku out of the way, he would be free to continue his crusades. Blinded by his own ambition, 
Fire Lord Sozin left his former best friend to die. A new avatar. Raised by the monks of the Southern Air Temple, young Aang possessed a mastery in airbending. By age 10, Aang had surpassed his master in the art, and by the time he turned 12, he had invented a new airbending technique called the Air Scooter, which led to his becoming the youngest airbending master to ever live, earning him his very own blue arrow-shaped tattoos that all of the masters wore before him. It wasn't long after that the monks revealed to Aang that he was the avatar, and that he alone was destined to master all four elements and bring peace to the world. Typically, this news is given once the avatar reaches 16 years of age, however, the monks feared that a war among nations was imminent, and it didn't leave them much time to prepare. Aang immediately began to feel overwhelmed by his new responsibility, though, especially once his caretakers pressured him to train harder. The only monk who was sympathetic towards Aang was the elder monk Gyatso, his airbending teacher and guardian. Whenever his training would start to take its toll, Gyatso insisted that Aang take a break and have some fun. He believed that it was vital for Aang to be allowed to grow up as a normal boy. Unfortunately, the other monks disagreed, and they decided to send Aang away to the Eastern Air Temple, where he would focus solely on training. Unbeknownst to them, though, Aang had overheard their conversation, and frightened by the new circumstances, Aang jumped on his flying bison Appa and made his escape. Aang couldn't catch a break, though, because while over the southern ocean, a storm caused Appa to plunge into the sea. In an incredible display of power and self-preservation, Aang surrounded himself and Appa in an air bubble, but it quickly froze into an iceberg, leaving them in a state of suspended animation. The Last Airbender Hey, wait a minute, that's, that's the title of the, the- A hundred years passed since the Avatar's disappearance until one day two bickering teenagers from the Southern Water Tribe, Katara, a waterbender, and her brother Sokka, a boomerang boy, which is not a real thing, I just made that up, accidentally free Aang from his iceberg. Upon discovering that Aang is an airbender, they escort him back to the Southern Water Tribe where he's met with many bewildered stares. As it turns out, none of them have ever seen an airbender before. No one has in over a hundred years. That's because during Aang's absence, the Fire Nation waged war against the others, starting by completely wiping out all of the Air Nomads. The Fire Lord Sozin took advantage of an incoming comet, later dubbed Sozin's Comet for obvious reasons, to enhance his firebending abilities and storm all four air temples, slaughtering every monk within to ensure the death of the new Avatar, thus making Aang the last known airbender in existence. The news of all of this transpiring doesn't come lightly to Aang. It's a, it's a bit of a wake-up call, to put it lightly. Aang quickly realizes that the entire fate of the world rests on his shoulders. Not only is it his duty to defeat the Fire Nation, but it's his destiny. So to fulfill the prophecy, Aang and his new friends set off on a quest to master every bending technique while carefully evading capture by the Fire Nation, who have been in search of the missing Avatar for all these hundred years. Book 1, Water. On their journey to the North Pole in search of a waterbending teacher, Team Avatar finds themselves in a small Earth Kingdom village under attack by Hei Bai, a monster from the spirit world. Because Aang is the one person who can bridge the physical and spirit worlds, the villagers believe he can make peace with the spirit. So, he travels to the spirit world where he's told that Avatar Roku has a message for him on the winter solstice. Aang returns and calms the attacking spirit, restoring peace to the village. In order to retrieve Roku's message, though, Team Avatar must cross into the Fire Nation waters on their way to a fire temple dubbed Roku's temple. Before arriving at said temple, the three are met with a blockade of Fire Nation soldiers led by the newly promoted Admiral Zhao. They make it through, but the Fire Prince Zuko pursues them through the blockade. While inside the Fire Temple, Aang manages to enter the sanctuary after narrowly escaping capture by Zuko and the other Fire Sages, who instead capture Sokka and Katara. He's confronted by the spirit of Avatar Roku, who warns Aang about Sozin's comet. The comet is due to return in less than a year, at which time it will increase the Fire Nation's power, allowing them to end the war with a final assault. If Aang is to stop the Fire Nation, he must defeat the Fire Lord before the comet's arrival, and for Aang to have any hope of defeating the Fire Lord, he must first master all four elements. It's a hell of a ticking clock. Roku's spirit then briefly possesses Aang's body, repelling Zhao's forces and destroying the temple. Aang is unnerved by the fact that he has to master all elements in under a year. Why doesn't he just learn every language in a week while he's at it? So despite still being a relatively inexperienced waterbender herself, Katara begins teaching Aang everything she knows about waterbending. While in town to buy supplies, she comes across a waterbending scroll owned by pirates and swipes it so that they can both learn its new techniques. Katara struggles to learn the new moves, while Aang picks them up quickly, much to her frustration. Meanwhile, Zuko, always hot on the trail, encounters the pirates and agrees to help them search for the scroll, knowing that it will lead them to the Avatar, which of course leads to the capturing of Aang, Katara, and Sokka. Luckily, the three manage to escape using their newly developed waterbending skills. And also, Sokka is there, but 
He does he can't he's not a waterbender. Meanwhile, Zuko's crew begins to question his leadership skills, so his uncle Iroh explains to them that the prince didn't get his trademark scar in a training accident, as the crew were led to believe, but in an Agni Kai, a type of ceremonial firebending duel with his own father, Fire Lord Ozai, the grandson of Sozin. When Zuko spoke up in a meeting protesting the Fire Nation generals ends justify the means mentality towards their own soldiers' lives, his father challenged him to Agni Kai as a punishment for such insubordination. And when Zuko refused to fight back, his father burned his face and banished him from the Fire Nation. For the last three years of Zuko's life, he's not been allowed to return unless he restored his honor by finding and capturing the Avatar, something no one has been able to do in over a hundred years, so until recently, the odds haven't exactly been with Zuko on this one. During this time, Team Avatar arrives at a Fire Nation town that's hosting a festival. Here, the trio learns about the Deserter, a man named Zhang Zhang who went AWOL on the Fire Nation army and lived to tell the tale, making him a powerful firebending master who's unaffiliated with the Fire Nation. Unfortunately, Aang has difficulties maintaining the self-discipline required for safe firebending and accidentally burns Katara. However, this leads Katara to discover that she possesses the power of healing. Meanwhile, Admiral Zhao arrives to fight Aang, but Aang escapes him by using Zhao's lack of self-control against him, causing him to burn his own ship. Turns out uh, Zhao's not exactly the master tactician he'd have people believe, and Zhang Zhang, being Zhao's former teacher, has always seen right through him. Afterwards, the group journeys to the Northern Water Tribe, where they're welcomed warmly by its citizens. Aang and Katara seek the teachings of Paku, the Northern Water Tribe's best waterbending master. However, being a stubborn traditionalist, he refuses to teach a woman like Katara in the ways of combat. That is, until he notices Katara's pendant, which was a gift from her mother. Paku recognizes the necklace as the same one that he gave to his fiance years earlier, meaning, wait, is Katara his fiance? Nah, I'm just kidding, but her grandma was. She left him after realizing he was kind of sexist. Imagine that! Realizing that it was his stubborn commitment to tradition that drove away his true love in the first place, and impressed with Katara's fighting skills, Paku finally agrees to train her. Meanwhile, Uncle Iroh helps Zuko fake his death and sneak aboard Zhao's lead ship as his fleet departs for the North Pole. Zhao had previously attempted to assassinate Zuko after Zuko secretly thwarted one of Zhao's attempted captures of the Avatar. After all, if Zhao captures the Avatar, then Zuko can do it to regain his honor, can he? As the Fire Nation's armada approaches the Northern Water Tribe, the citizens scramble to set up their defenses. Aang believes speaking to the moon and ocean spirits could give him some insight into defeating the Fire Nation. However, once Aang's spirit leaves his body, Zuko arrives and kidnaps Aang's defenseless body just before the Fire Nation begins their attack. The Firebenders manage to infiltrate the fortress of the Northern Water Tribe and raid the city. Aang attempts to return to the spirit world, but since his body has been moved, his spirit rockets across the sky towards the location of his body. This allows Sokka, Katara, and Yue, princess of the Northern Water Tribe, and Sokka's girlfriend, to follow his spirit back to Aang. In order to destroy the moon, thus eliminating the source of the waterbender's powers, Admiral Zhao slays the moon spirit Tui in its physical form, despite warnings from Iroh to not destroy the moon. What kind of crazy plan is that? Thankfully, Aang returns and slips into the Avatar state, a sort of turbocharged mode where the Avatar is able to channel the knowledge and power of all of their previous incarnations and joins forces with the ocean spirit La to wipe out the Fire Nation armada. After Iroh Iroh and Zuko both survive the assault, Zuko confronts and fights an escaping Zhao, while Iroh stays with Team Avatar to try to revive Tui. It's at this point we should probably mention that while Iroh was a renowned Fire Nation general at one point, Iroh is now a good-natured person who doesn't necessarily stand with the Fire Nation so much as he wants to keep his nephew from slipping into the abyss, and therefore doesn't really harbor any ill will toward Team Avatar like Zuko does. It's revealed that the Moon Spirit touched Princess Yue as a baby, giving her a spark of life. Yue gives that spark back, sacrificing herself to become reincarnated as the moon spirit. Oh, poor Sokka. That's rough, buddy. Zhao is then pulled underwater by the ocean spirit and is cast into the spirit world to wander through the fog of lost souls for all eternity as punishment for his misdeeds. Good lord, at this point I think drowning would have been a better fate for him. Upon hearing the results of the battle, Fire Lord Ozai, back at the Fire Nation, commands Zuko's sister Azula to hunt down her traitorous uncle and brother for failing to capture the Avatar. Book 2, Earth. After their journey to the North Pole, Aang and his friends travel to Omashu, searching for Aang's childhood friend, King Bumi, in hopes that he'll teach young Aang the ways of earthbending. It's also suggested to Aang that he consider fighting the Fire Lord by triggering the Avatar state, since doing so at the North Pole was so effective. However, Aang is later warned by Avatar Roku that if he's killed during the Avatar state, the Avatar spirit will disappear and the line of reincarnation will end forever. To make matters worse, Aang and his friends arrive at Omashu to find it captured, having been renamed New Ozai by Azula. Meanwhile, Zuko and Iroh receive a surprise visit from Azula 
Azula, who asks them to return home. Zuko, believing his banishment to be over, excitedly agrees, while a more reserved Iroh reluctantly accompanies him to Azula's ship, where they discover her invitation is a ploy to imprison them. They escape, but are forced to live as outcasts because their actions at the North Pole are viewed as treasonous by the Fire Nation. Team Avatar's search for an earthbending teacher takes them to an underground earthbending tournament, promoted by a guy named Shin Fu. It's here that they witness a young blind girl named Toph show off formidable earthbending skills. She fights under the secretive moniker, The Blind Bandit. Unfortunately, Toph is restricted by her overprotective parents, who keep her isolated in hopes that she'll eventually conform to the social roles of the Earth Kingdom aristocracy. It goes about as well as you'd expect. So Toph runs away from home and joins Team Avatar, but her parents, believing she was kidnapped, pay off Shin Fu and local earthbending teacher Master Yu to retrieve her by any means necessary. Aang begins his earthbending training with Toph, but it doesn't come easy. Avatars naturally have more trouble learning elements that run counter to their own, as the elements are a reflection of their personalities, and the strong, steady willpower required for earthbending is a little difficult for a twinkle-toed air nomad. Elsewhere, Zuko, determined to get stronger, struggles with lightning bending, an advanced form of fire bending. His anger keeps him from obtaining the precision required to pull it off, and his frustrations only grow in knowing his father and sister have already mastered the skill. Trying a different approach, Iroh shares his belief that wisdom comes from many sources. He advises young Zuko to study the other elements, and in doing so, he can become a wiser and more balanced individual. To drive the point home, Iroh then teaches Zuko the art of not lightning bending, but redirecting lightning, a technique he originated by training with waterbenders. At an oasis, Team Avatar encounters a professor who tells them about a hidden spirit library in the desert. The group travels into the desert and eventually locates the entrance to the library. Toph, claiming she's never really seen the appeal of books, pun completely intended, elects to stay outside with Appa. Wan Chi Tong, the giant owl spirit who guards the library, lets them in on the condition that they don't use any of the knowledge in the library for war. Sure, no problem. Inside the library, however, Sokka learns something that could end the war. An upcoming solar eclipse will temporarily render the firebenders completely powerless. Unfortunately, Wan Chi Thong refuses to let them leave with this information and sinks the library into the sand. And while all of this is going on, a group of sandbender bandits attack, making away with Appa. Toph, who's learned to use her feet to gauge her surroundings, is marred by the desert sands and is unable to stop them. The rest of Team Avatar makes that out of the library, but the professor decides to stay behind forever and revel in the endless well of knowledge that he's discovered. I mean, I don't know what he thinks he's gonna eat down there, though. I mean, maybe the owl will give it- Oh. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, no. With their main mode of transport, Appa gone, the team is stranded. After a long, exhausting hike through the desert, Aang tracks down the sandbenders who stole Appa and learns that his beloved flying bison was traded to a merchant in Ba Sing Se, the capital of the Earth Kingdom. When Aang learns that Appa's been traded, he gets so angry that he triggers the Avatar state, nearly killing the sandbenders, showing once again the true terrifying power of the Avatar state. The group then travels to the impenetrable walled city of Ba Sing Se on a mission to find Appa and inform the Earth King about the solar eclipse. However, they soon discover that this is no easy feat. They're assigned a liaison, a young woman named Ju Di, who gives them a tour of the kingdom along with its many disturbing rules, one of which forbids mentioning the war. There is no war in Ba Sing Se. However, the rigid rules aren't the most disturbing thing they encounter within the Earth Kingdom. Team Avatar also discovers the existence of the Dai Li, the secret police force of Ba Sing Se, which enforce the law under the command of their corrupt leader. Long Feng, who appears to know something about Appa. Finally, the group decides to sneak away from their chaperones to find Appa. They discover a facility located at the bottom of Lake Lao Gai, where they uncover a brainwashing operation perpetrated by Long Feng and the Dai Li to control Ba Sing Se from behind the scenes. Zuko, who had been hiding out in Ba Sing Se at the time, helping his uncle manage a tea shop, finds that old habits die hard and tracks Aang down to the facility, but stumbles upon an imprisoned Appa first. He plans to use Appa as a bargaining chip, but his uncle encourages him to free the Sky Bison instead. Surprisingly, Zuko agrees with his uncle. Team Avatar faces off against the Dai Li in an intense battle that ends with the good guys victorious, but not without loss. And afterwards, Aang and Appa are joyously reunited. After discovering the king has been kept in the dark about the war with the Fire Nation, as well as the Dai Li corrupting his kingdom, the group breaks into the Earth King Kuei's palace to warn him about the upcoming eclipse and the conspiracy against him. Though initially unsuccessful, as the king is unaware that there's even a war going on thanks to the Dai Li's propaganda, Team Avatar is ultimately able to to expose Long Feng's lies. Long Feng is then promptly arrested for treason, and the Earth King agrees to cooperate with Team Avatar as they prepare for an invasion of the Fire Nation during the Solar Eclipse. Meanwhile, Zuko falls mysteriously ill, which Iroh believes is caused by his nephew's internal conflict. Zuko struggles with both what's required of him as Prince of the Fire Nation and his true self, whose growth Iroh has been trying to foster for years. Later, Aang travels to the Eastern Air Temple to meet with Guru Pati, who trains him in mastering the Avatar state through unlocking his chakras. During this time, Toph is captured 
by Shinfu and Master Yu, remember them? They lock her in an iron case to negate her earthbending powers and start to take her back to her parents. However, they've vastly underestimated Toph's ability as she realizes there are tiny bits of earth within the metal and tears open the enclosure, thus creating a new form of earthbending, metal bending. Back at the air temple, Aang slowly unlocks all of his chakras, except for the last, which requires he give up all earthly attachments, including his feelings toward others, specifically Katara, which he simply cannot do. He abandons his training with the Guru after sensing Katara is in trouble back at Ba Sing Se. What sort of trouble is Katara in? Well, Azula and her entourage have infiltrated the Earth Kingdom disguised as friends of Team Avatars, the noble warriors of former Avatar Kyoshi. Upon gaining everyone's trust, Azula frees Long Feng, captures Katara, and takes over the Dai Li, having Zuko imprisoned as well. Zuko officially meets Katara for the first time and discovers they have a lot in common. Katara even considers lifting some of Zuko's burden by healing his scar with her healing powers and a small amount of water from the spirit oasis of the Northern Water Tribe. It's basically super healing water, and Katara only has a small vial of it. At that moment, Aang, aided by Iroh, attempts to free Zuko and Katara. Iroh implores Zuko to consider the path he's on, in hopes that the prince will abandon his brutal past and become enlightened. Much to Iroh's dismay, though, Zuko chooses to attack the Avatar instead, and a battle ensues. Aang enters the Avatar state just as Azula strikes him with lightning, essentially killing him and severing his connection to the Avatar spirit. Launching into the offensive, Iroh delays the Fire Nation's forces just long enough for Team Avatar to escape. Iroh then surrenders and is taken prisoner as a traitor to the Fire Nation, and Katara uses her healing powers as well as that spirit oasis water in order to resuscitate Aang, but consequences of being killed in the Avatar state remain. Aang is no longer able to enter the Avatar state at all. Book 3, Fire. Aang awakens to find himself and his friends aboard a stolen Fire Nation ship. He's still very weak, sporting a wicked scar on his torso, and to top it all off, everyone outside the ship believes him to be dead. Again. Though Aang's friends assure him that this is a good thing, because if the Fire Nation thinks he's dead, they won't be chasing him down, nor will they expect their impending invasion. Back in the Fire Nation, Fire Lord Ozai finally makes an in-person appearance to welcome his children home and praise them for taking out the Avatar. However, Zuko secretly suspects that Aang is still alive and seeks out a terrifying-looking assassin assassin to finish the job as a failsafe. Sokka finally admits that his lack of bending skills have made him feel like a bit of an outcast, so to ensure that he can hold his own in the oncoming battles, he decides to build upon his sword fighting skills. Sokka eventually convinces Pian Dao, a renowned Fire Nation swordmaster, to be his instructor. Pian Dao puts Sokka through the ringer, but delivers on his promise and even helps him forge his own sword out of the metal from a meteor. After all, one sword is an extension of oneself. Sokka's guild grows, though, and he eventually confesses to Pian Dao that he is not, in fact, from the Fire Nation. A bold move, considering the Fire Nation's attitudes towards anyone who's not Fire Nation. Pian Dao responds by attacking Sokka, but after he proves himself in an intense sword duel, Pian Dao reveals that this was his final test, assuring Sokka that he already knew he wasn't Fire Nation, but trained him nonetheless because he truly believed that the way of the sword belongs to all nations. On Eclipse Day, many friends and allies reunite with Team Avatar to launch an invasion on the Fire Nation. Their invasion forces rely heavily upon several forms of bending and even some aquatic vehicles, but with their combined efforts, they're able to circumvent the Fire Nation's defenses and infiltrate the capital, waging a grueling assault on the place. However, once Aang finally reaches the Fire Lord's palace, he discovers that no one is there. After all, Azula had already learned of their plans after infiltrating Ba Sing Se and gaining the Earth King's trust. The eclipse begins as Sokka, Aang, and Toph search for the Fire Lord. They find Azula in an underground bunker, and she provokes them into chasing her to stall them until the eclipse is over. Meanwhile, Zuko at this point has learned many things about himself since returning home, including the fact that he is the great-grandson of Avatar Roku, on his mother's side. In light of this information, as well as growing disdain towards Ozai's plans, Zuko confronts his father and tells him that not only does the Avatar still live, but he's decided to join forces with him. Before Zuko can leave, though, Ozai offers to tell him what happened to his mother. Fire Lord Azulon, Zuko's grandfather, had ordered Ozai to kill Zuko as a punishment for Ozai mocking the death of his brother Iroh's son, Lu Ten. In order to save her son's life, Zuko's mother created a treasonous plan to poison Azulon so that Ozai could take the throne. The plan worked worked, and Zuko's mother was banished for her efforts. You know, I'm starting to think that this, uh, Fire Lord Ozai is, uh, not such a great guy. 
Suddenly, the eclipse ends and Ozai attacks Zuko with his firebending finally back. Using Iroh's technique, Zuko redirects Ozai's lightning back at him and retreats to free his uncle. However, upon arriving at his cell, he discovers that Iroh has already broken out. At this point, the invasion force is exhausted and has no choice but to surrender. Aang then flees with his friends to the Western Air Temple, with Zuko trailing them on a stolen war balloon. There, Zuko desperately tries to prove himself to Team Avatar and wishes to atone for all of his past mistakes. It's only after he helps save them from Sparky 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 Boom Man, or Combustion Man, or, or whatever you want to call him, the very assassin that he had previously hired to kill them, that the crew accepts him as Aang's firebending teacher and the newest member of Team Avatar. Except Katara. Katara's still a little salty about the whole following them and constantly betraying their trust and helping Azula kill Aang thing. But a quick field trip with him and a confrontation with her mother's killer eventually convinces Katara that Zuko's really changed. Unfortunately, once Zuko tries to teach Aang how to firebend, he discovers that he's lost his ability to bend now that he no longer fuels his bend with his own rage. Toph suggests that they learn from the original teachers of firebending, the mighty dragons, but supposedly Iroh killed the last dragon long ago during his metaphorical past life as a general. Recalling that the dragons imparted their knowledge to the Sun Warriors, Zuko and Aang travel to the ruins of the Sun Warrior civilization where they discover a tribe of Sun Warriors still exists. In order to learn the true meaning of firebending, they must first carry a sacred flame up a mountain and be judged by the masters, who turn out to be a pair of surviving dragons. After being deemed Worthy, the two dragons teach that firebending is a source of life, not destruction. The Sun Warriors reveal that Iroh lied about the extinction of the dragons after his own training. They then ask Zuko and the rest to do the same to protect the remaining members of the species. Team Avatar leaves with both Aang and Zuko firebending better than ever. With Sozin's Comet on the horizon, Aang decides that it's probably best to fight the Fire Lord after it passes, since, you know, that would be when the Fire Nation is most powerful, but Zuko derails the plan when he reveals that Ozai intends to use his Comet Enhanced Firebending bending to destroy the entire Earth Kingdom continent during that time. The gang begins frantically training Aang to make up for lost time, with the end goal of stopping the Fire Nation's assault on the Earth Kingdom. Needless to say, the kid starts to get a wee bit stressed out, not to mention conflicted at the idea that in order to stop the Fire Lord, Aang has to kill him, which goes against many of his teachings and philosophies. That night, Aang dreams of a mysterious island that appears in the middle of the sea. The next day, Aang awakens on the island he'd seen in his dreams. Uh, much to the worry of Team Avatar, because Aang has vanished at a pretty important moment. Meanwhile, Ozai names Azula the successor to the Fire Nation throne, effectively making her the leader of the Fire Nation now, while Ozai declares himself Phoenix King, ruler of the world. A bit presumptuous, but... Uh, that's just how he is, I guess. On the island, Aang discovers that he's on top of a giant lion turtle, who gives him the insight and guidance he's been seeking. Meanwhile, Team Avatar enlists the help of a bounty hunter named June to find Aang, but when June is unable to locate their friend, Zuko asks her to find his uncle Iroh instead. Her tracking skills take them to the outer wall of Ba Sing Se, where they're reunited with Iroh, along with King Bumi, Zhang Zhang, Master Paku, and Master Piandao? What is, what is this? What's going on? Turns out that all of these old guys are members of the Order of the White Lotus, a secret society led by Iroh dedicated to sharing wisdom regardless of nationality or politics. The team decides to split up to help stall the Fire Nation's plans. Zuko and Katara set out to handle Azula. Sokka, Toph, and Suki, one of the aforementioned Kyoshi warriors, but, you know, it's actually her this time, will attempt to deflect the Fire Nation airships headed towards the Earth Kingdom, and Iroh is to lead the White Lotus Society in the liberation of Ba Sing Se. Sozin's Comet arrives, and Ozai prepares for battle. Zuko and Katara confront Azula, but as Azula had been steadily unraveling ever since her return to the Fire Nation, she stubbornly challenges her brother to Agni Kai. Zuko initially prevails, but is struck down when Azula fights dirty and fires a lightning bolt at Katara, which he dives in front of. During this time, Aang begins to duel Ozai, but narrowly avoids his powerful attacks, which are augmented by the comets. After a long battle, the Order of the White Lotus successfully liberates Ba Sing Se, while Sokka, Suki, and Toph stop the attack on the Earth Kingdom. Katara fights Azula, freezing her in ice and chaining her to the ground, she then revives Zuko with her now exceptionally strong healing abilities. Katara got, like, super OP throughout the series? Remember the scene in the Southern Raiders where she just literally suspended the rain around her and turned it into icicles? I'm not complaining, that was an amazing scene, I love that episode, it's, it's just an observation. During their duel, Ozai overpowers Aang with his enhanced firebending, pushing him back first into a jut of rock. But the rock hits Aang in exactly the same place that Azula's lightning did, miraculously unblocking his chakras and restoring his connection to the 
Avatar spirit. Nice. Aang enters the Avatar state and easily overwhelms Ozai, yet refuses to kill him. Instead, he employs a much more honorable technique that he learned from the Lion Turtle back when he went missing. Energy bending. By using an ancient form of bending, Aang is able to alter Ozai's energy and permanently strip him of all firebending abilities, thus defeating the Phoenix King and saving the world without bloodshed. Days later, Ozai and Azula are imprisoned, the newly appointed Fire Lord Zuko declares the war over, and Team Avatar have a little celebration at Iroh's tea shop in Ba Sing Se. Aang and Katara slip out to share a quiet moment together where they finally embrace each other and share a kiss under the sunset. And as we learn in The Legend of Korra, the Avatar's friendships go on to transcend lifetimes. And at last, we've reached the end of the Avatar The Last Airbender timeline. I know we didn't include the comics, but if you want, maybe we'll dive into more Avatar timelines in the future. Maybe a Legend of Korra one? Let us know. I've been Jacob with Channel Frederator. Of course, if you liked this video, be sure to subscribe, and remember, Frederator loves you.